Thanks for coming out for tonight's Bible study time. I'm glad you're here. I do believe um, we're going to have some folks joining us on Facebook, but this is a great number of people here in person. So thank you for coming. Give yourself a hand for coming out on this uh, Sunday night for Bible study. Amen. I was thinking about, uh, I was telling Paul earlier uh, today, I said, man, welcome to eternal darkness. I feel like uh, when we t- change the time, I feel like it's always dark. So praise be to God. Here we are. We're going to make it through, folks. It doesn't last that long, really. You know, it changes back over the second uh, week of March. So for those who are keeping count, we don't have much to go, okay? We're just getting started, but it'll be okay. I do want us to pray as we get started. Also, we are going to receive offering this evening, so if you'd like to prepare yourselves to give, you can do that. Um, But my wife wanted me to mention to you um, something, and that is on December 17th, we'll be having the farewell celebration for Pastor Desmond and Pastor Keisha. And so as many of you may know, or if you don't know, let me remind you that they are in the process of transitioning to Pennsylvania to be the full-time state youth director there for the Churches of God in the state of Pennsylvania. And so on that Sunday, we're going to have a special celebration. You might have saw the information in the bulletin this morning. But that uh, day, Pastor Desmond will be preaching. We'll be honoring their family. And uh, one of the things we're going to be doing is having a luncheon downstairs in the gym. And for this luncheon, the committee that's been working on this has decided that we're going to have that meal catered in. And so we are asking you to pay a small portion of that. And the reason why we're doing the catering is so that no one has to be busy scurrying around that day trying to take care of getting you know, food prepared and that type of thing, but rather so that they can be in the service and be a part of celebrating the Wellingtons. And so there is a, a fee of $7 uh, per person. If your family's large, it's a maximum of $35. So if you have a large family, the max you'll pay is $35. Um, for that meal, but you can see Stacy at the Connect Desk and get a ticket. There are tickets for sale. They again are seven dollars, um, and you need to purchase your tickets before I believe December the third. And we're asking that you pay cash or check only to uh, Stacy there at the desk. So we'd appreciate that. And I know it's going to be a good a good day um, when we celebrate the Wellingtons. Secondly, I want to make you aware. Um, and Brandon, can you confirm I'm on Facebook? Can you at, make sure I know? Yes, okay. So I want to make you all aware that tomorrow the Illinois Church of God State Office is going to announce they have, that they have selected the new state youth director for Illinois. And so that's a wonderful thing. We're excited about that. And um, what's exciting about that is that beginning uh, in January, the Illinois State Youth Director will be full-time at the state office. And so the Bethalto Church of God will no longer be hosting the state youth director here in one of our staff positions. So I want to be very clear with all of you before you hear that announcement tomorrow. We are not, as you know, for many years now, we've had um, the state youth director on staff here as either our children's pastor or our youth pastor. We've had three individuals serve in that dual role capacity, but through some things that the new state overseers worked on, the good news is that, um, you know, he's been able to, for at least the next two years, be able to allow for that youth director to become a full-time position, and so when you hear that tomorrow, don't think that that person's going to be working here at Bethalta Church of God, because that's not the case, but um, what is important to know is that most likely uh, that individual and their family will be attending here from time to time, because they are, they're being expected to live in the Bethalto area because the state office is here now. So I think it's an exciting update for the the, uh, state office, but I also think it's exciting for us in the sense that while we honor those who've served in these dual role capacities going forward, our children's pastor as well as our youth pastor will be fully dedicated to the students and families of Bethalto Church of God. And so I'm thankful for that opportunity that we've had, but I'm also thankful for the future for what God has allowed us to do. And I want to take a moment since he's with us tonight to introduce to all of you, if you hadn't met him before, Pastor Mike Lampkin, you stand. Pastor Mike is our new children's pastor. He officially started this morning. Amen. We're glad to have uh, he and his family joining. Uh, He and his his wife and children are in a couple weeks of transition here between Illinois and Missouri, but um, they'll all officially be here around Thanksgiving. But they're living over in Edwardsville, and so we're glad to have them. The youth and some of the elders helped them move in on Friday, and so we're glad to have Pastor Mike and his family here. And I'd encourage you, if you haven't taken the opportunity to introduce yourself, please do so. He may not remember your name for a while because, you know, there's a lot of you and only a few of him. So anyway, uh, take the opportunity to meet Pastor Mike, and we're excited about what 
he's going to do as he leads our children's ministry here at Bethalto Church of God. But with all those things out of the way, why don't we pray, and then I'm going to ask the gentleman to come to receive the offering. If you have the offering, you can give that. Please remember there's online ways you can give. You can text the word GIVE to 84321. You can also scan the QR code there on the seat back in front of you, or you can go to our website, bcog.cc, and click on the giving tab. Why don't we pray? Father, thank you for this opportunity we have to give tonight in this offering. We thank you for the time we have to come together and learn and grow in this Bible study. I pray, God, over these next several weeks that we spend together, that you just open the eyes of our heart to have knowledge, wisdom, and understanding of, God, that which you desire to speak into our life for such a time as this. I believe, God, that you'd open up every heart and life to receive from you. And, God, we pray now that you bless the gifts that are going to be given this offering, minister to the needs that are represented in this room and throughout our congregation. And, Lord, we pray through it all you'd receive the glory, the honor, and the praise. We pray these things tonight in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. As they come tonight, let them serve you. And I want to get started. So hopefully you received an outline as you came in this evening. And uh, in that outline, I wanted to just be clear about a couple things. And that is, um, you know, this is going to be a multi-week series. Uh, we've got two of these scheduled. We're trying to just analyze the schedule for the next couple of weeks after next Sunday night because of various things we have coming up, like the Thanksgiving dinner and Christmas and that type of thing. So please bear with us as we lay out the schedule for this. But I believe this will go on for many weeks. And so the purpose of why I wanted to get us together and have this study is I remember, you know, I've said this before, but I've been Church of God nine months prior to my birth, okay? My parents were going to the Church of God, and as a result, here I am, Church of God. My mom got saved in Church of God when she was around eight years old, and subsequently, you could say the rest is history. But I remember being a child, and I uh, was always convinced that Jesus was coming every Sunday. And not only was Jesus coming every Sunday, that I needed to be ready to meet Jesus. And the realities are, that is still true, that Jesus could come at any time. The Bible says, no man knows the day or the hour but we have to understand that we need to be aware of the times and the seasons in which we find ourselves living. And I'm sure many of you with the recent events that have happened in Israel and what's subsequently been going on in the Ukraine war as well as Russia and China for a couple of years now, things are definitely escalating in a certain way that really make the Bible begin to jump off of the page. And so what we're going to do over these next several weeks is really help to unpack the idea of what in the world is going on. Because I think it's important that we understand the things that are happening in our world today. Now, I want to begin with a few ground rules, and so if you want to follow along in the outline, you're going to have everything that I've written down. Now, I might say more than that, but you can follow along here, and here's the thing that I want to be clear about. The Bible's going to serve as our primary source of information. While there's a lot of good other books, and I've used multiple other books uh, to study from and prepare from, as well as online resources, you can feel free to check these out after the service, but the thing is, the, the Bible has to be our, our source of truth. And that's what we're going to use as the primary source for everything we're going to talk about during this study. Also, I want to be clear, this is not going to be an exhaustive study, meaning I'm not going to dive into every verse in the Bible concerning the second coming of Jesus Christ, because there's just, quite frankly, you could keep doing that on and on and on for weeks and months and years. And there have been people that have been studying the end time for years. And so we need to understand that we'll go as deep as time will allow us in this class, but we also need to recognize that you may need to study some on your own. So I'd encourage you to bring a notebook or use the paper that you've been given and take notes on that so that you can jot down things that maybe you need to spend time doing extra study on. Also, I'll be putting some references in the material, so if you want to do some self-study at home, you can do that. Thirdly, I want to remind you that we will focus on the primary events, or what we'll call the signs of the times, that all Christians need to be watching for. There are some very specific things concerning the end times and the second coming of Christ that really matter, and then there are other things I would call minor details that we may not spend as much time on in this class. But nonetheless, we want to look at those primary events, the big milestones, if you will, of what is going to happen in the second coming of Christ. The fourth thing is current events are going to be weaved in to our study for illustrative purposes only. I want you to know if you were to go online tonight and start Googling various things about the end times, there will be people that will try to tell you that the president of France is the Antichrist. Now, whether or not the president of France is the Antichrist, I don't know whether or not he is. Maybe he is the Antichrist. But what I'm going to do in this class is I'm not going to stand up here and say that the president of France is definitely the Antichrist. I'm also not going to tell you that your debit card that you're carrying in your purse or your wallet tonight is the mark of the beast, okay? Because I don't necessarily believe that. 
that to be true. But what I am going to do is try to use current events to help illustrate the fact that the Bible is leaping off of the page right now, that we need to be aware of what is transpiring in the current events of our world, and we need to be paying attention to what's going on. And then lastly, I want to mention that there are a lot of different views and theologies concerning the end times. You can get a lot of teaching out there about this, but what we're going to do in this class is because we are a Church of God church, we're going to stick to teachings that are generally accepted as being in agreement with the Church of God doctrine concerning the end time and the second coming. So those are our ground rules for the next several weeks we spend together, and I hope you'll agree to them because that's what we're going to be guided by. So let's begin. So eschatology. What is eschatology? Well, that is the official theological term for the study of the end times. Eschatology is um, the, the theology or the study of death, judgment, and the final destiny of the soul or of humankind. Or another way to say that is eschatology is really the study of the last things. And so what we're going to be doing is studying the last things because the end time has been something that's been discussed not only since the foundation of human history, but across multiple religions. A lot of times we think that the study of the end time is unique to Judaism or Christianity, but really all religions of the world have some belief in theology concerning what is going to happen at the end. There's no real sense that, that the world as we know it is going to go on forever. When you think about this, the, the end times, it's been something that's prevailed in Christian thinking and Judaism for some time. There are many of the Old Testament prophets that actually brought messages concerning the end times. I've listed out those uh, for you here, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Joel, Amos, Zechariah, and Malachi, all of them in one way or another made references to the end times. Now, similar to one of our ground rules, there are some of these that we're going to find as we get into the study tonight that are major players, that God gave major revelation concerning the end time, and then there's some minor actors that God didn't necessarily give as much revelation to. But the point is, is that God has been speaking to humanity for, for uh, almost 3,000 plus years now concerning those events that are going to come at the end of time. And so it's important to see that this is, this is a, a common theme that's been throughout all of Scripture. When we go from the Old Testament period into the New Testament period, we find that teaching on the end times is something that's been refer, referred to in many of the books of the New Testament. So often when people think about the end times, they think about the book of Revelation. And I want to be clear also, I should have put this as a ground rule, our study over these next several weeks is not going to just be an exhaustive study of the book of Revelation to really understand the end times, we have to look at all that the scripture has to say concerning the end time. The revelation is probably some of the most extensive that we have in the New Testament, but in the Old Testament, we have Ezekiel and Daniel specifically that God gave great revelation to concerning those things which will come together at the end. So when you begin to, you begin to put together what God said in Ezekiel and Daniel as well as Revelation, you begin to get a good picture of what the end is going to be. But then we find that Jesus himself spoke a lot about the end times. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all include references to the end times, as well as the book of Acts. And then Paul himself, as I mentioned in the morning service, spent many of the epistles making references to the end times, including what he wrote to the church at Corinth, as well as the church at Philippi, Colossae, Thessalonica, and then even in his letter to Titus, Peter himself gave a great reference to the second coming. James, the brother of Jesus, gave reference to the second coming. And John, in addition to the revelation the entire book, as we know, of 1 John is spent concerning the spirit of Antichrist that we're going to talk about this evening. And so it's important we understand the Bible is filled with reference after reference after reference from, from the beginning all the way to the end to the second coming of Jesus. And so it's important that we understand that the Bible has much to say about the second coming or eschatology, which is the study and theology of the last things. Secondly, I think it's important to understand concerning the study of the end time is that prophecy is an important part of end times teaching. And the reason for that is because we're talking tonight about many events that have not yet occurred, but we can see them coming up on the horizon. 
As I was studying and preparing for this class, I found this definition of the word prophecy, and I think it's a really good definition of prophecy that to me is like, man, that's the most sense I've ever heard someone describe prophecy. And so the definition I found is this, that prophecy can be defined as the history of the future, meaning that we're looking at things that have been written down in the past to tell us about events that are going to happen in the future. And so when I thought about that, I'm like, how cool is that to think that God has given us everything that we need to understand the times and seasons that we're getting ready to enter into. So the prophecies we're going to talk about this evening are really the history that God gave men of old that we're going to now look at as a history of those things that are yet to come that we would call the future. It's important to understand the reason why prophecy matters is because God, he holds all time in his hands. He knows the end from the beginning is what the Bible says. So I know sometimes Susan always tells me, she goes, I don't like you talking to me about the stuff that's going to happen in the future. It just, you know, it's unsettling to me. Well, the realities are we don't need to be scared or concerned about what's going to happen, concerned about prophecy, but rather we need to realize prophecy is what's used by God to give us a glimpse into the future of the things that he already holds holds in his hands. God already knows how this is going to end. And in case you haven't read the end of the book, at the end of the book, we win. At the end of the book, Jesus wins. At the end of the book, the devil is locked away in the pits of hell forever. You and I are going to rule and reign with God in heavenly places. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. And so we have much to be excited for. So the future shouldn't scare us, but the future should make us excited knowing that in the end, we win. If you believe that, why don't you just give God a hand tonight for the fact that we win. But what God does is he uses prophets to deliver prophecy to his people. As we already talked about, all of those men that I read their names previously from the books of the Old Testament, they are Old Testament prophets that God used to warn Israel about the times that they were getting off track with God or the impending judgment that was yet to come. Many of the events that we find in the Old Testament have already been fulfilled. There are much prophecy. If you were to read Isaiah, there's much of that prophecy that's already happened. If you were to read from the book of Daniel, you would find that much of that has happened, but yet we find there are elements of what God told Isaiah, there are elements of what God told Daniel, there are elements of what God told Ezekiel that are yet to be fulfilled. And so there is still Old Testament prophecy that is hanging out there in our current hour that we need God to fulfill as part of the end time. In the New Testament, we find that Jesus and many of the other apostles, they, they operate in the gift of prophecy, declaring that which was yet to come. And there's a key indicator of when prophecy is godly or not. And I would encourage you to think about this anytime you might get a prophetic word from someone or begin reading prophecy. First of all, you need to ask yourself and evaluate, does this prophecy line up with Scripture? If you ever get a prophecy that cannot be supported by the book that we call the Bible, then I would encourage you to really continue to pray and ask God to give you revelation if that prophecy is of Him. The Bible tells us there can be false prophets. There can be those that try to prophesy. The Old Testament itself even gives an account of a prophecy that was prophet lying, as I might call it. And so you need to be careful to evaluate, does the prophecy uh, line up with Scripture? Secondly, to evaluate prophecy, you need to understand, does it glorify Jesus? We'll talk about that a little later. All prophecy should bring glory and honor and praise to Jesus. It should lift him up. It should glorify him. If it's tearing down Jesus or trying to move you away from the direction of Jesus, then I want you to know that that's most likely not godly prophecy. Thirdly, a key indicator of godly prophecy is does my spirit bear witness with what is being said? Is this something that the Holy Spirit on the inside of me is bearing witness with the Holy Spirit inside of the prophet? And therefore, if it does, it's most likely godly prophecy. And then thirdly, does it bear witness with godly counsel? If you were to go and talk to, say, myself as your pastor or Pastor Mike or Pastor Desmond or maybe one of our church elders or maybe someone on the prayer team or someone that you look up to spiritually that you believe is more more spiritually mature than you are, if you were to talk to them, what would they think about that? Would they believe that it is godly? Would they believe that it aligns with the word of God? Would they believe that it glorifies Jesus? It's important that we understand that we need to judge prophecy to determine whether it is from God or not from God. And the reason for that is the Bible itself is filled with prophecies. There's over 1,817 prophecies in the Bible. And there's been signs 
scientific studies that have been done of the prophecies that are in the Bible that have already been fulfilled, they've been fulfilled with 99.5% accuracy. Now, that's better than, than just, you know, any, anyone else in giving prophecy. And so it's important that we understand that God, when he gave prophecies, he was intentional, he was direct, and he was specific. And as a result, there's been an evaluation done. When you think about prophecy in the context of all the other topics in the Bible, over 30% of the Bible is prophecy. So I think it's important that we understand here that we need to give ourselves to the study of prophecy so that we can understand those things that are yet to come. Amen? Amen. So what are the questions that we need to answer? How are we going to look at studying the end times? Well, we're going to look at this biblically speaking. Now, I would encourage you, for some things, I have you know, actually wrote out the scripture reference for you. For other things, we're going to need to get out the Bible. So whether you have a Bible app or whether you brought a Bible physically or whether you're at home watching, I'd encourage you to have your Bible handy because we are going to be looking at scripture. We're going to be reading scripture, and I believe that scripture is going to help us to understand. So how we're going to study scripture uh, concerning the end times is really asking the same three questions that the disciples asked of Jesus. In Matthew 24, verse 3, it says, Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? That's what they asked Jesus. And, and those are the three questions we're going to ask ourselves as we study the end times. When will these things be? Now, there are some that have tried to evaluate when is Christ coming back. There are those that believe Christ is going to come in the 1960s. There are those that believe that Christ is going to come in the 70s. There are those that gave 88 reasons why Christ was going to come in 88. Anybody remember that? 88 reasons why Christ was coming in 1988. There have been those that thought that Christ was going to come in the year 2000. I remember uh, there on New Year's Eve, you know, not only was I concerned about Y2K, but I thought, man, Christ is coming. I need to be ready. My buddies and I were celebrating New Year's Eve, and I'm like, oh, God, please let me be saved in Jesus' name. Like, but then I thought, that's so stupid, because is he coming according to when it turns 1120 in Israel, or what part of the world? Is it, when it wherever I'm at? And so, you know, I'm not going to say Christ is coming in 2020, or 2023, or 2024, but I believe the Scripture gives us a sign of when these things will be. And that's the second question they ask. What will be a sign of your coming? You see, it's important that we understand there are signs that God gives us in the heavens and in the earth, as we'll find out, to let us know that the end is near. And so we need to understand what are the signs. And then lastly, they ask the question, what will be the end of the age? What they're really saying is, what is it going to look like when all of this thing wraps up? What is the grand finale actually going to be? And so these are the same questions that the disciples asked Jesus that we're going to use to answer this idea of what does the end look like and where are we in relationship to the end. Really, to understand why they asked those questions, we need to rewind. So if you rewind with me back, this coming uh, spring in March, we're going to celebrate the uh, triumphant entry that Jesus makes into Jerusalem, riding on the donkey. And then a week later, <clears throat> we're going to celebrate the fact that, you know, they crucified him, but yet grave could not hold him, and he rose again. So it's in the context of after Jesus came riding in to Jerusalem on a donkey, that he was there in the temple. And we find that what occurs is this, is that Jesus had talked to his disciples, disciples after he cleansed the temple and he had, you know, issued all of these warnings against the Pharisees, Sadducees, and scribes. And he says this concerning the temple in Matthew 24 and 2. He says, do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. What Jesus was doing is he was speaking a prophetic word concerning Herod's temple, which existed in Israel at that particular point in time. And we find that that was the catalyst that captivated the attention of the disciples to the point that they pulled Jesus aside and wanted to ask him a question concerning the prophetic word that he had just been given concerning the destruction of the temple. You see, their questions were not meant to challenge or, or question Jesus' authority, but rather they were to gain understanding. And our, our approach to excuse me, studying in times should be to gain understanding about what's happening in the earth right now. 
How many of you have been turning on the TV the last month? Anybody been watching TV or your Facebook app or your Reels or whatever? There's a lot going on. I mean, Israel is under attack, in case you didn't know, okay? Let me just make sure everyone knows. Israel is under attack. And you know that happened at the end of one of their most holy celebrations. That happened at the end of the the Yom Kippur uh, celebration, the Feast of Tabernacles. And we find that they came and they, they went into these people's houses and they began attacking them and they began, you know, seizing them and they began killing them and they began taking them hostage. And we think it's important that, that, you know, there there is a loss of life that's going on on both sides here, but the Israeli people were not asking for this when it transpired. They were, they were brutally attacked by a group of, I believe, militant, you know, people that were not, um, they, they are a terrorist organization, in my opinion. And so we find here that they were brutally attacked. And you think about this attack that's on Israel, and yet as we begin to see these events that have unfolded over the subsequent weeks, it's quick to see that the nations of the world, and including the people of the United States, are divided on where one might stand concerning Israel. And so when we think about what's going on, we find that all the scripture is pointing back to this one little nation, this one little nation that's actually smaller than the state of New Jersey. It's a very small piece of land, but yet it seems to dictate the affairs of the entire world. And the reason for that is because the people of Israel are God's chosen people. And as things occur in Israel, so they affect what goes on in the rest of the world. And so we need to understand what's going on in Israel right now because it affects our lives as much as it affects those that are living there going through the brutality that's occurring on a daily basis. So we find that Jesus has said that Herod's temple would be destroyed and not one stone would be left unturned or thrown down. And we find that in 70 AD, this is exactly what happened. The Roman military general, Titus, came to Jerusalem. He destroyed the temple. He tore it down. And when he tore it down, he not only tore it down, but he brought in horses and cattle with plows behind them and they actually tilled over over the ground. What they were trying to do here is greatly disrespect the children of Israel by tearing down what was their most holy and sacred place where they gathered to, for worship, where they gathered in, in honoring God. And they came in there and tore the whole place down. And that wasn't good enough for them. They wanted to till over the ground. And what they were sending a symbol of when they tilled over the ground was to say that it was as if this never existed. Now, it's important for us to understand here. And and put this in context, that there had been two temples. We find that God had given David the ability to fight wars and secure the resources so that a physical temple could be built. Because prior to that, what had been occurring is they had went around with a mobile temple, a tent, if you will. So it was called the Tent of Meeting. And they went around from place to place. But finally, they settled in Jerusalem and they had the temple. And so David was able to secure the resources. But because he was a man of war, he wasn't able to build the temple that was needed for God because God wanted a permanent structure. And so his son Solomon was able to build the temple for the Lord. But we know that during the Babylonian exile that that temple was destroyed. And so later King Herod would come along and build another temple that was in equal stature to, um, you know, the first temple that had been built. But now in the 70, 80 period, that temple had came down. So we find that a prophecy that Jesus had given concerning the destruction of the temple has occurred. But we find what happens after that is that the Muslims subsequently built what is known as the Dome of the Rock on this site that is the Temple Mound. Now, I know if you go out online, you can study this and you can find there are people that disagree. But repeatedly, time and time again, including an archaeological dig that that occurred in the uh, late 80s, once again uncovered that where they built the Dome of the Rock, underneath that is where the temple was originally built. If you think about why there's so much tension that exists in Jerusalem concerning the Temple Mount, it is because the Muslims, which are not a godly religion, I want to assure you that Allah is not the same as Jehovah God. They are two different people. They are not the same individual. They are not the same deity. And we find that they have built what they believe is their their holy place, the Dome of the Rock, on this same site. And so what we begin to understand is this, is the first key sign concerning the second coming is that there has to 
to be something, some attention given to the fact that a temple is necessary to be built in Jerusalem for the return of Christ to occur. You say, Pastor, why does that matter? Well, if you go out and look, you'll find there's a lot of teaching on what's known as the third temple. Now, some would say there have been other minor temples built since the original temple, and that is true, but I believe there needs to be a similar temple built in equal stature to the one that existed when Solomon built it, as well as the one that existed in the day of Jesus. So this first key sign we want to talk about tonight is the temple is a key element in the end times and the return of Jesus for multiple reasons. Let's begin looking at that concerning some of the earliest prophecies about the return of Christ, and that is in Daniel 9 and 27. In Daniel 9 and 27, it tells us that the Antichrist will use the temple as one of the unifying factors for the years of peace. What we find is that the Antichrist, when he comes on the scene, he's going to negotiate peace. He's going to negotiate that peace between, I believe, the Israelis and the Muslims. And one of the things he's going to try to do is say that they can co-equally exist. And everybody can sing Kumbaya and everybody can be happy. But folks, I want to tell you, the Bible is plain. You're either for God or you're against God. And so while this might seem to be the case that maybe for a period of time they can sing Kumbaya and be happy, I believe it's only probably for about three and a half years if possible. But we find that the Antichrist has deceptive motives I'll talk about later. And so it's important that we understand there has to be a temple. There has to be that coming together to allow people to be unified. In Matthew 24, 15, Jesus makes reference to something that Daniel spoke about. And that is the abomination of the desolation that has to happen in the holy place. It has to occur in the holy place. Well, if there is no temple, then how is it possible for the Antichrist to stand and declare that he is God and that they need to worship him as God, they need to bow to him as God, and they need to offer sacrifice to him as God? There has to be a physical temple in order for that to happen. And I believe Jesus would not have said this if he didn't believe that there needed to be a temple that was resurrected and built in the end. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we find that the son of perdition, who is the Antichrist again, will need to be worshipped in the temple. So the apostle Paul had built upon what he understood from Daniel's writings and what he understood that Jesus had said, and he's saying now that this man, the Antichrist, needs to be worshipped in the temple. Let's actually turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and I want to read this into your hearing so that you can see, because I believe Paul does a good job of summing up Daniel. Daniel and Jesus' is teaching when he writes this in 2 Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians verse, uh, chapter 2, verses 3 and 4 says this. I'm sorry, I'm in 2 Timothy. That made no sense. I was like in 2 Timothy. <clears throat> 2 Thessalonians verses 3 and 4. Let no one deceive you by any means. For that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. We'll talk about that another week. And the son of man is revealed, the son of man of sin rather is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So we find here that Paul is summarizing what Daniel had talked about and that the Antichrist will want to be worshipped as God, that Jesus reinforced when he talks about Daniel's prophecy concerning the abomination of the desolation. And here we find what Paul is saying is that this man, the lawless one, he will be the one that exalts himself above all and he sits in the temple wanting to be worshipped as God. And then we find in Revelation 13 and 6 that again it reinforces that the beast, the Antichrist, Christ will speak blasphemy against God in his tabernacle. If we look at Revelation 13, 6, I want to read that into your hearing as well. I I want us to hear what John received from the Lord concerning this particular matter because it's important that we see this. In Revelation 13, 6, it says, Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blasphemy his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. So we find that speaking about the beast or the Antichrist. So what we need to understand here is the first sign of the end times is that we need to be looking for the signs of the temple that are being built and sacrifices being restored at the temple. Since 1987, there's been a group of people known as the Temple Movement that have began preparations for the third temple. 
Now, I've put a reference in here. You can go and read about this in more detail. There's all type of literature over that. But what one event I want to talk about that I didn't put in the notes is this. Is recently, there were purebred red heifers that came from the United States and Texas, and they were taken over to Israel. And you say, why does that matter? Well, because the sacrifice of the red heifer is so crucial to the establishment of the temple, once again, and the re-implementation of the temple sacrifices. And so we find that, that the Jews and the Jewish priests have been monitoring these red heifers that, that were delivered there in, uh, in the last two years, and they're monitoring to make sure that they believe they are of pure quality to be able to be used in such a way that they could be the perfect sacrifice that is necessary for the re-implementation of the daily sacrifices at the temple. Why is this important? Because it goes to show us that things are in the works concerning the rebuilding of the temple. Not only that, but as you study, and you can look up this link, there's other videos out there I could have put in for reference. You can go and see that they're also beginning to try to collect items to rebuild the various instruments that need to be used in the temple for the various uh, you know, parts of the temple, the outer court, the inner court, the holy of holies, for all of the, the articles of worship that are used in the temple. So there's much work that's being done concerning the rebuilding of the third temple. And so I think that we need to stop and think about the fact that God is giving us a sign. And I thought about how the, the very question that prompted the disciples to ask about what did, did the end going to look like? What are the events going to look like? Really point to the fact that the temple is going to play a crucial role in the return of Jesus Christ. It's a key sign that was the opening question, but yet it unlocks so much when we begin to stop and think about those events that are yet to come. And so I want to stop and ask a dis discussion question. You can answer if you like. If you have an answer, just raise your hand. But do you think the tension about the need for a third temple has created some of the Middle East turmoil through the years? Meaning between the, the, the Israelites and the Muslims and the Palestinians. Do you think the need for this third temple has created some of that tension? And if so, why? This is just a thought question. I know there's a lot of people here maybe if you might not feel comfortable answering, but... If anyone has a thought, I'd be happy to hear your thought. Otherwise, I'll give you my thoughts. My th yeah, you know, Sharon's like, what are my thoughts? Well, so I definitely believe that this has created much tension. Um, actually, if you were to look at this, um, what's bizarre about this is that the Muslims believe that this Temple Mound site is actually a place that Abraham desired to uh, build a place for them and their worship. As, the, as we think about the descendants of Ishmael, which are what end up becoming uh, those that are Muslim. And so we find that there is this common shared history, but yet at the same time, we know that we have the son of the promise, which is um, Isaac, and then we have the son of the flesh, which is Ishmael. And so we find here that there has been this ongoing tension that has existed between the, the nations from the very foundation of time, because you've got one that is God's chosen selected people, and we have one that is operating out of the flesh as a result of you know, Abraham and Sarah getting a little bit overzealous. And so I believe that the need to have this temple restored is something that is significant in the end times. And, and I think that it has created tension. Even the situations that are going on right now in, in the area that we find with the Gaza Strip, you know, this is a piece of land that really, I'm going to say this and, you know, don't run me out, but the Israelites could have prevented the issue they're dealing with right now. Okay, let me tell you how. Because they should have eradicated all the Philistines. But when you study the Old Testament scripture, they did not eradicate all of the Philistines. Now, someone recently asked me this. They were like, Pastor, why is it that God said to kill all the people and leave none? Well, there are very clear reasons because some of these things that we're talking about are spiritual matters. Some of these people represent spiritual matters. And we find that I believe the Philistines represent a spiritual matter. And because the children of Israel had grace, if you will, and didn't completely eradicate them, they are still dealing with that problem today. There is enmity between the people of God and the people of the flesh. And the idea that there would need to be a third temple that is built for the soul 
sole purpose of, of worshiping, honoring, and glorifying Jehovah God is intimidating to the other nations that are in that part of the world, to the other religions, because I believe in their heart of hearts, they know that there is one true God, and he's the only one that is worthy of worship. And so this tension that exists in our land is a result of the fact that there are those things that even the children of Israel have done in operating the flesh instead of following what the Holy Spirit and God have told them to do. So, first sign, there needs to be a third temple. Second sign we're going to talk about is the Antichrist. I'm just taking this stuff in the way I found it in the Bible, okay? Matthew 24, verses 4 and 5, and then we're going to look at verse 11. So, I did not print this, so we're going to have to turn there. So, if you turn to Matthew 24, verses 4 and 5. Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. Then verse 11 says this. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. I want us to understand that another key sign is this, is that there will be much deception in the last day. One of the first things Jesus mentions here is to be on guard. He uses the word take heed to deceptive teachers who will be coming in his name. And their goal is to deceive many. I want us to realize we're living in this hour right now where there's much deception that is going on in the world. Now, I believe there's deception happening in the government systems of our world, but there's also deception happening in so-called churches of the world and ministries of the world. It's important that you are checking out the source of the information that you're reading and making sure that it comes from good, godly people that believe the Bible. We find that there are also, there, this is talking about more than just false teaching. What Jesus Jesus is introducing here is this is larger than false teaching. What he's beginning to point to is the spirit of Antichrist and the Antichrist himself. A key sign of the end times is that the Antichrist spirit will be at work and the Antichrist himself will arise. The Antichrist spirit, let me just say this, has been at work in the earth for a long time. I believe the Antichrist spirit has been at work in the earth all the way back to the days of Moses. Now you say, Pastor, how do you say that? Well, Moses is really a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ. So much of what transpired in Moses' life is a a parallel to what transpired in Jesus' life. Case in point is this. In the time that Moses was being born, we find the Pharaoh issued a decree that all of the boys that were born in Goshen needed to be killed, right? They needed to be thrown into the river and die. What occurred in the days that Jesus was born? There was a decree that went out that not only did they need to count all the people, but they heard that there was going to be a king that arose through the Jews, and so the result was that Herod decided, I need to kill all of, the, for all of the boys that are being born in this time. And so we find that that Antichrist spirit has prevailed in the earth for some time. And there has been this whole idea that the work of the gospel of Jesus, the events that needed to occur to ensure that Christ came to the earth, that he lived, he died, and was resurrected, and now is coming again, that there would be those that would rise in opposition to that. And so so even most recently in our world, I think there are a couple of instances of the Antichrist spirit. Any of you ever heard of a, a little event that happened between 1939 and 1945 called the Holocaust? That was the Antichrist spirit that was at work in the earth, trying to eradicate the people of God from the face of the earth. The Jews are God's chosen people. You and I as Christians are just grafted in. We get to enjoy the benefits as a result of the work that Christ did. And thankfully, the Apostle Paul was willing to bring the gospel message to the Gentiles as well. And so we find that, that in that period of time, Adolf Hitler, in my opinion, operated under the spirit of Antichrist. A couple of years ago in a little event called COVID, I believe the spirit of Antichrist was prevailing in the earth in that hour. I've never heard something as so stupid as this, is that when they wanted, in Illinois especially, when they wanted you to be able to come back into church and they wanted you to come in with your mask on and sit down and not sing. Now they could sing on the stage with a shield up in front of them, 
is what was supposed to have been happening. Just so, in case you didn't know, this was the actual rules, state of Illinois. Congregation, come in, sit down, keep your mask on. The people on the stage could sing to you or chant to you, depending on your church culture. But they needed to have a shield in front of them, a plastic shield, so that their spittle could not get on you. Mind blown. Stupid. But I think about this. Why did they not want you worshiping God? The Bible says where two or three are gathered together in his name, he takes up dwelling in that place. The Lord inhabits the praise of his people. I'm telling you, the spirit of Antichrist, in my opinion, was at work in the earth in that hour. Not only that, think about another stupid thing. You could come to church, but we could not shake hands. We could not fellowship. We could not. I wasn't supposed to lay hands on people and pray for people because we might spread the coronavirus. Well, again, what does the spirit of Antichrist not want you to do? If there be any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church. Let him anoint them with oil. In order to anoint you with oil, Tim, I either have to come up and touch you or or maybe I could stand back here and fling it at you, and you could get anointed with oil. But i got to be able to put oil on you. i got to touch you. And we find that when we come together in prayer, it's biblical to lay hands on one another. What is my point? The spirit of Antichrist, I believe, was at work in the earth during the period of COVID. And so we have to understand that this thing that is going to try to continue to beat down the children of Israel, the Jewish people, that's going to continue to try to beat down the people of God, is not going anywhere. But if anything, the spirit of Antichrist is going to get worse as we get closer to the return of the Lord, because it has to give way to the ultimate culmination of the Antichrist spirit, which is the Antichrist themselves. I believe the Antichrist themselves will be one of the last signs that are released on the earth that we'll be able to understand. But yet it's one of the first scriptures that Jesus gives us when he begins talking about what the end of things is going to look like. He wants us to understand that this spirit is going to be at work in the earth, but it will give rise to an actual antichrist in the earth. And Daniel was the first one to tell us about the antichrist. If you've been going to Gary Borland's class on Wednesday nights, you've probably been hearing about this. So I'm going to just briefly touch on it, but I'd encourage you to get his outlines. They're really good. But in Daniel 8, this is where he gets this vision of the Antichrist. And in verse 23, it says, In the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their fullness, a king shall arise. If you're taking notes, I would mark on your paper, circle that. The king he's talking about is the Antichrist. That king Daniel is referring to is the Antichrist. He says some very specific things about him. He will have fierce features. He will understand sinister schemes. I'd underline these things. Fierce features, sinister schemes. What does that mean? That means that this person, I believe, when you study out what it means to have fierce features, they're going to be pleasant on the eyes. Why do some people probably think the, the president of uh, France is uh, the Antichrist? He probably looks good to people. He has fine features. The point is, the Antichrist is not going to be J.B. Pritzker, in my opinion. He's not going to be a short, plumpy man. That's Illinois Governor Pastor Mike, in case you didn't know. He's not going to be a J.B. Pritzker, okay? That's not the case. He's going to have fierce features. So it's important to see God is telling us very descriptive things about this person. But secondly, it says he's going to have sinister schemes. What does that mean? He is going to, as I'm going to uh, relate to you in a little bit, he is going to make deals with the devil. He's in essence going to be a son of the devil who sold his soul to, sold to the devil. He's actually going to be able to work miracles according to demonic spirits, not the Holy Spirit. And that's what this is referring to. He shall be mighty. M underline this. He's going to have, pa his power shall be mighty. He'll have might. He, but it will not be his own power. You see, because he's going to be having delegated a power from the devil himself. He shall destroy fearfully and shall prosper and thrive. So what does that mean? As much as he's going to be trying to bring people together and talk about all the wonderful things he's going to do, he's also going to be one that tears down and destroys and takes out people that are not really working on his benefit and doing the things that he wants to do. Why are some people so concerned about the political underbelly that's going on in, in America right now and in the other parts of the earth? It's because all of these things, when you think about what's occurring right now, 
where people are taking out their, their enemies and not allowing political processes to play out. It's because this stuff concerning the spirit of Antichrist and Antichrist himself, all of these actions we find are building towards the ultimate time when the Antichrist himself will appear. He will prosper. He's going to be a wealthy person. He's going to thrive. And then it says, he shall destroy the mighty and also the holy people. Now, here we find destroying the mighty, I believe in studying this, refers to those that have great position and power within the earth. Those are the ones he's going to try to take down because he's going to want no one else to look good except for him. But yet also those people who are holy, which that's why you're here tonight. You're trying to have eyes to see and ears to hear what God is saying to the church church. You're trying to live under the anointing and power of the Holy Spirit. You're trying to stay under the blood of Jesus Christ. You are the holiness of God when you're trying to live for him. And I believe that if we would stay in tune with God in the hour in which we're living, he will allow us to see this stuff that is playing out in the earth right now. We are holy people. But you see, the spirit of Antichrist doesn't like those people that see things with godly eyes because they see right through their schemes. If you see right through their plans, they see right through their lives and they're able to say that's a bunch of nonsense and that is not godly, that is not holy and that is not right. If you've ever needed a discerning spirit it is now. What is happening in the earth right now requires a discerning of spirits to know the things that are of God and not of God. Verse 25 through his cunning, underline that, he'll be a cunning man. But he's going to use that cunningness to, 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 to cause deceit so that he can Allow things to prosper under his rule. Can I just say that these words are pain me to come across my lips. But communism probably will be, in my opinion, the way this thing wraps up. You know why that is? Because it's the only way the Antichrist can be God of everything. If you really study what goes on in China, the ruling family, the ruling party has everything they want. While the people in the streets are crying out. North Korea, same instance. The ruling family has everything they want. And you know what they do when people rise up in opposition to them? They kill them. They off them. Because it does not work for them. Well, I don't know how else the Antichrist is going to be able to do the things he wants to do unless he's in a communist type society. So when I look at the events happening in America right now where the younger generation is like, man, we need to be communist, it troubles me to think that the United States would ever become a communist country. But what I do believe to be true is that those ideas and principles of communism have to be prevalent in the earth, in my opinion. Otherwise, the Antichrist will not be able to accomplish the things he needs to do. Because ultimately, what is his goal? As verse 25 goes on to say, he will exalt himself in his heart. He will think greater of himself than of anything else. Why? We already read about it earlier when Paul's writing, but he believes that he is God. But we find that his goal is to destroy many in their prosperity. He shall even rise against the prince of princes, which is Christ Jesus. He tries to, to take out Jesus, we know, at the Battle of Armageddon. We'll talk about that another week. But yet he shall be broken without human means. What this means is this, is in the end, He's going to lose. In the end, Christ is going to win. In the end, the Antichrist shall not prevail. So what are some of the characteristics you need to be looking for in the actual Antichrist themselves? One, it'll be someone in leadership. When you study out the four horsemen of the apocalypse, all of these things in Revelation chapter 6, I believe, speak to the Antichrist and what he will do while he's on the earth. One of them, the first horse, is this, is that he will be riding on a horse and he will be a conqueror. The the Antichrist will be someone that has leadership ability, most likely has some type of military background, and they will be a conqueror on the earth. When you survey the land and you look out there, there are many names I could call right now of people that have the Antichrist spirit on them, that are in leadership positions in the wor on the world stage right now, that easily could probably step into this role. But it's important to understand that the Antichrist will come and he will be a leader. Secondly, Revel Revelation 13 
Corinthians 5 lets us know that this person will be an effective communicator. They will be clear in speech. They will be easily understood. They will mesmerize people with their words. How do we know that? Because they're going to also have charisma. Let's look at this Revelation 13 and 8. This is an amazing scripture to me to think that humanity could get to this place. But after the events of COVID, I'm convinced anything can happen with humans right now. Uh, in a bad way, and this scripture gives way to that. Revelation 13, verse 8. Revelation 13, eight, verse 8. It says, all who dwell on the earth will worship him. Folks, this is going to get to the point where people are worshiping this man. Do we ever think it's possible that humans would worship another human. I didn't think that's possible. But after the events we've seen over the last several years, it's really easy to understand that this is something that could happen in our world today. I want to read the rest of that because it's good. It says, whose names have not been written in the Lamb's Book of Life, slain from the foundation of the world. You and I have something that's really important to take away from that scripture. If you're a blood-bought, born-again child of God and your name is written down in the Lamb's Book of Life, I believe your eyes will be open and you will not be deceived by the spirit of Antichrist or the Antichrist themselves because you are the Lord's. You are marked. You are covered under the blood of Jesus Christ and therefore you will not be given over to believe the lies and the deception of the Antichrist regardless of how much charisma that individual might have. And I believe it'll be a man, by the way. Uh, You need to understand that, that you will not be sucked into that because you are the Lord. Next we find this. He will partner with demonic spirits and prophets. Okay? Now, some people say to me, is it possible for for the devil to do miracles? Well, yes, it is. Is it possible for the devil to perform signs? Yes, it is. Let's read again in Revelation 13. Let's look now at verses uh, 12 through 14. It says this. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence. Now, what's going on here? Let me explain to you in just a moment. Um, In the first part of Revelation chapter 13, it's talking about the Antichrist. And then it says that the devil causes another beast to arise. This is the prophet that's going to be alongside the Antichrist. And we find that this prophet, whom is a false prophet, is going to be alongside the Antichrist. And this is the things that he's going to be doing to glorify and lift up the Antichrist. He says, and he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence. And causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs, so that he even makes fire from come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he has been granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. We find here that what's going on is that the Antichrist has partnered with this demonic prophet, and they are doing great exploits for for in the name of the, of the Antichrist, and people are going to be convinced that these things are real. But we continue back in the, the sixth chapter of Revelation. When you look at the four horsemen, you find that also what's going to happen is the Antichrist is going to try to give peace, but then they're also going to be the one to take peace away. In a, in a subsequent week, we'll talk about the seven years of peace and three and a half of peace and three and a half of turmoil and tribulation. Also, we find that they're going to control economic systems. I want us to look at this in Revelation 6 and 6 because twice did John get a revelation about this. And I think it's important when you think about your monthly budget and you think about your bill at the grocery store and you think about how things keep going up and going up and you can't seem to be paying the bills. Well, again, it's all giving way to what the Antichrist is going to do on the earth. In Revelation 6 and 6, it says, And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a Daenerys and three quarts of barley for a Daenerys. And do not harm the oil and the wine. In essence, what they're getting at here is that the cost of these items, which are so basic just to make a loaf of bread, are going to become exorbitant to where they're not going to be able to afford them. And then if you look over in chapter 13, where we've been reading from as well, in verse 16, it says, And he causes all, both small and rich, uh, great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast and the number of his name.
name. What we're saying here is that the Antichrist is going to control the world system. This is where you get into things about there's going to be one currency in the world. This is where we get into things like they're trying to do away with paper money because it's easier to have one world system. Do you know in other parts of the world, you actually, there's a credit system where your ability to have credit and get credit is dependent on what everyone else does, not your own personal responsibility. I'm telling you, all of these things are moving us inch and inching closer to the Antichrist arising on the earth. But lastly, I want to tell you another characteristic of the Antichrist is they will bring war, they will bring hunger, and they will bring death to a fourth of the earth. Revelation 6 and 8 talks about that. We have to understand that the spirit of Antichrist and the Antichrist themselves is not looking out for people's best interest, but they want people dead because they want to be worshipped, glorified, and honored. And so we find here that a key element, a key sign we need to be looking for in the last day is the spirit of Antichrist to keep rising in the earth and for the Antichrist himself to come on the scene. Now, I want to just pause here and say that I believe most likely the Antichrist is on the earth somewhere right now. I have to believe that. When I think about all the signs of the times and where we are in this timeline, they very well could be a, a, an infant, a toddler, a child, a junior high student. They, but I believe most likely that individual's on the earth somewhere. You say, Pastor, why is that? Because as we keep going through this over the next several weeks, you're going to see that so many of the things that need to occur in order for Christ to return have been done. The boxes have been checked. The, the X's are placed. Everything is lined up. And so what we have to see is that it's only a matter of time before these things begin to break onto the scene. Now, I'm not going to stand here and tell you who I think it is. I don't really have a, a preference on who I think it is at this point in time, but I believe that, that someone is on the earth that is preparing to step onto the world stage. When you think just now what's going on in Israel alone, it can be so easy for a leader to step onto the world stage and be able to negotiate a peace between Israel and all of the nations that are trying to raise against them. Because let me just be plain, the battle of Armageddon cannot happen right now. The nations of the world cannot truly descend upon Israel, in my opinion, until there's this period of peace that has to occur that we'll get into. So what we should be looking for right now is a leader to step onto the world stage that tries to say, I'm going to bring peace. This is the reason why we have to be prepared, because I believe the Lord is coming soon and very soon. And when those events begin to unfold, I believe the rapture of the church is going to occur. So it's necessary for us to be watching about what is going on. But also, I want to just talk briefly in closing tonight about the spirit of Antichrist. You see, you and I may be looking for the big guy, the Antichrist himself. But what we're dealing with every day is the spirit of Antichrist that's at work in the world. Even though the Antichrist may not necessarily be on the scene right now. When John was somewhere between 90 to 100 years old, we'll say, when he was writing 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, he's telling them at that point in time this. He's saying that, you need to beware because the Antichrist is at work in the earth right now. The spirit of Antichrist was prevalent in that day. How much more is it prevalent in our day? But in order to know if something is of God or not of God, we have to test the spirits. That's what John told them. He said, my little children, test the spirits to know if this is of God or not of God. And we find that John also says that there are many Antichrist spirits that are at work in the earth. We have to understand we're just not dealing with one, but we're dealing with many and I encourage you today to ask God to give you revelation of the things you're dealing with to understand if it is an antichrist spirit. The Bible lays out very plainly, John does the most extensive teaching on the spirit of antichrist. What he says is this, is he says the antichrist will deny that Christ is the savior. If you come in contact with teaching and people that are denying that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven, you're dealing with antichrist spirit. I want to tell you tonight, Buddha does not get you to heaven. Muhammad does not get you to heaven. Some other spirit that people have tried to tell you gets you to some great future state is not going to get you to heaven. The only way to heaven is Jesus Christ. There's only one way to get in, and that is through him. He is the son of God, the perfect lamb without spot or blemish who came to take away the sins of the world. But if there is someone teaching or a spirit that's trying to tell you that Christ is not the savior, then we have to understand that is an antichrist spirit. 
John also said that an antichrist spirit will deny the Father. We find that we serve a triune God. There's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Father loved humanity enough to send His only Son to die for you and I. We have to realize that what John is saying is those who deny Christ and those who deny the Father, they have an antichrist spirit. But thirdly, we find that John was very plain in 2 John 1 and 7 to say those who deny the second coming of Christ have the spirit of Antichrist. I want to read that into your hearing since we are in this study on the, the end times and the signs to be looking for. Let's look at 2 John chapter 1, verse 7. For many deceivers... Have gone out into the world who do not confess Christ as coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Folks, I want us to understand that Jesus is coming again. He's physically coming again to get his church from this earth. And so we need to be watching for his return, but also we have to understand there are those that are saying that Christ is not coming. As I try to get ready to close, I want to think about what Pastor Mike and I were talking about right before we walked in through the door earlier. That is this. As many of us in this room, if we've been around church for, let's say, 40 years or longer, probably up until about 20 years ago, you heard Christ is coming again all the time. Most likely, every service you went to, you heard it. There were studies like the ones we're starting right now that were taught on a regular basis. There were Sunday school classes and Wednesday night classes. There were youth group classes. There were, you know, children's church type classes that we were talking about Jesus is coming again. And you find that throughout time, you know, that message kind of waxed cold. Why did that wax cold? Because, you know, week in and week out we would hear it, but yet Christ wasn't coming. But here's the thing. Just because he hasn't come does not mean that he is not coming. We cannot grow slack concerning the promise that God has given. Jesus himself made a promise that if he went and prepared a place for us, he would come again to get us. Jesus Christ is coming again. The angels that were standing there as Jesus ascended back into heaven in Acts chapter 1 told the disciples that this same Jesus that you see leaving you now on the clouds, he is going to come again in like manner. I'm telling you, Jesus Christ is is coming again. So there are those that would try to deny that Christ is coming, but I assure you that he is coming and we need to stay true to the message in this hour more than ever before. But as I was studying for this class, I asked myself, what is the root of the Antichrist spirit? And John so eloquently lays this out and I thought, man, this is revolutionary to me. I don't know, it jumped off the page at me. John indicates that the Antichrist spirit could actually be found in those that have been a part of the church at one time. He says in 1 John 2, 19, they went out from us. Think about that. He's saying those that are operating in the spirit of Antichrist once were a part of us. Once were a part of the community of faith. Once were believers, but they were not of us. See, we have to start to put the scripture to here and understand that sometimes there are wolves in sheep clothing. There are those that appear to be angels of light, but really they're angels of darkness. There are those that masquerade around as Christians, but they're really witches. They're really people that are operating under a demonic spirit that are coming in week in and week out trying to just fit in, but they have an assignment. Recently, someone came up to me, and I've, I've studied this before and watched you know, different people preach on it, teach on it. But do you know the Church of Satan has an assignment that they are constantly operating in, and that is to destroy churches? And what they do is they are continually praying for demonic spirits to go into churches to bring division and to tear down the headship that God has put in place. Not only the pastor, but those that are surrounding the pastor. And the purpose for that is so that the work of the ministry can become ineffective, null, and void. But what those people do, and you can, you can go out and go, I could send you some links if you'd like to see them, where people talk about this. They send people into churches, and that is their motivation They might lift their hands in worship. 
They might praise God. They might say hallelujah. They might clap at all the right times. But really what they are is an assignment from the pits of hell to stop the work of the kingdom of God. And here we find that John, the man who laid himself on Jesus' breast, the one that Jesus called my beloved disciple, he is telling us in his old age, in his final days, that those who operate in the spirit of Antichrist once were among us. But he says this as he goes on, For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us, but they went out that they might be able to manifest What do demons do? They manifest themselves. And so he says that none of them were with us. We find here that what transpires in due course is that if you remain faithful, the things of God will be shown, but also the things of darkness will be exposed. We have to understand today that the spirit of Antichrist will be exposed, and we need to pray for God to give us the exposing power of the Holy Spirit and the revelation of God's word that we could see those things that are of God And not of God. And I think this really does make sense when you stop to think that those that are operating in the spirit of Antichrist could have actually once been a part of the church. When you step all the way back and think, what is the root of this Antichrist spirit? Well, it's Satan himself. He once was an archangel in heaven. And what did he try to do? He wanted to become like God. He wanted to be God. And therefore, he was expelled from heaven And a third of the angels fell with him. Doesn't it make sense that Satan himself would be the one that is trying to get this antichrist spirit to prevail amongst church people? Last, I'll close with this. Some people are believing that it could be possible that the antichrist will arise from the tribe of Dan. Wouldn't that be peculiar? That from one of the original 12 tribes, the antichrist would come forward. And you say, Pastor, you're scaring me. What are you teaching? Heresy, false doctrine. I'm just saying it's something worth evaluating. So I was preparing for these classes. The tribe of Dan got themselves in a little bit of trouble. And we find that as you start to read throughout the Old Testament, after they began the settlement of the land, we don't hear much about the tribe of Dan. But as you progress on into the New Testament, specifically Revelation, you see that Dan arises once again. But in the times that Dan is referenced throughout the Old Testament, after the settlement, we find they're referenced in a negative way in uprising against the larger body of the nation of Israel. And there's some that have studied, you know, uh, the eschatology way deeper than I have, that believe that out of their own people could arise this. I think about this, when you think about it, we think that they're the, you know, the, the nation of Israel goes from Dan to Beersheba. And we find that that's significant because the placement of where the tribe of Dan was in relationship to even the events that are happening now, even some of the events where some of the enemies are rising up against Israel, I don't know, it could just be possible that even from amongst their own, their own original tribes could be the Antichrist. All I'm trying to say in closing of this part of this teaching is this, is that the Antichrist spirit is alive and well on the earth And John gives indication that it rose from among those that were once a part of the fellowship of believers. And so we need to be aware that the Antichrist spirit could be at work in the earth in this hour. Well, that's all I have to say tonight. I'm not sure what you're expecting for this class. But what I'm hopeful you're starting to see is I'm trying to give you these nuggets from the Bible. Or what are the signs we need to be looking for? Tonight, what we're looking for is the building of the third temple. We're looking for the Antichrist and the spirit of the Antichrist to be at work in the earth. We'll be back here again next Sunday night. We'll be diving into at least two more bullets that God's given me for this class. But in the meantime, I want us to pray right now and ask for Holy Spirit to give us revelation of the truth throughout this week, for him to challenge us to go deeper on the areas that possibly were challenging to you tonight, and for God to open your eyes to be aware of the signs of the times that we're living in. Let us pray. God, I thank you tonight for these men and women. I thank you, God, for them being willing to sacrifice time out of their busy schedules to be here on a Sunday night to hear, to learn, to grow. God, I pray tonight that you would take the the word that you've given me to share with them. And God, I pray that you would use it, God, throughout this week to bring fresh revelation about the hour in which we're living. God, it is true that your word says no man knows the day or the hour. But God, I do believe it's possible for us to know the times and the seasons. 
And Lord, there is something happening in the earth right now. God, I pray that we would not be like an ostrich with our head buried in the sand. But I pray rather, God, that our head would be up, our eyes would be open, our ears would be attentive. And Lord, we would hear what you are saying. Lord, I pray tonight if there be anyone among us that's not saved, that's not under the blood of your son Jesus, I pray, Lord, that you would forgive us of our sins. We would confess you as our Savior. And Lord, we would strive to live for you from this day forward. God, we're asking in faith, believing tonight, that God, our faith would grow. And Lord, in the weeks that are ahead, God, we pray for continued revelation. We pray, God, for continued understanding. And we pray, God, that this end time study would not scare us or intimidate us but rather, oh God, we will be challenged, Lord, to be aware of this season and, Lord, to be pointing others in your direction. We pray blessings upon us as we go tonight. Give us traveling mercies. Be with us throughout this week. Anoint our prayer meeting on Tuesday night, our Bible studies on Wednesday, and, God, all the other things we have to do for your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name, and we say it together, amen, amen. God bless you. You stand in fellowship tonight as you're dismissed in Jesus' name.